For those of you who join us live by webcast, I'm Barb Zarnico, co-chair of the board of the ICA. It's my pleasure to introduce Barbara Shorter for this afternoon's session, I See Friendly Fats. Barbara is an associate professor of nutrition and the former director of the undergraduate nutrition pro program at LIU Post. She is also a member of the pelvic pain team at the Smith Institute of Urology. Barbara served on the AUA IC Treatment Guidelines Panel as an expert on IC and diet and is an ICA Medical Advisory Board member. She has pub published research with Dr. Robert Moldwin on the effects of foods and beverages on the symptoms of IC and continues to do research on this important topic. Welcome, Barbara. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak with you, especially about a topic that is so close to me. Um, as many of you know, I have had IC for about 30 years, and so I know exactly what you feel when you sit there and think about your bladder all the time, and I know your life evolves around your bladder, and there's nothing else but your bladder, it seems. And this is what a lot of people don't understand if they don't have IC. They can't even imagine what it's like. But it is something that, unfortunately, some of us do experience. But there is hope. And so we have a lot to talk about today. I'm going to be talking to you about some very positive things. Uh, we're going to be talking about diet. And I know you're always used to hearing what you can't have things that you shouldn't eat, but not today. Today we're going to talk about things that you should eat and hopefully things that you will enjoy and things that will make your meals taste better and things that will improve your quality of life. So I will start by putting on the first slide. Now you know that every day you eat a variety of foods. You have foods that contain nutrients that you've heard of, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, vitamins, minerals. And one of the things that you may not be that familiar with, although I'm sure you've heard it if you read magazines, phytochemicals, these, I just want to give you a brief definition of these. These are substances in foods. They're not vitamins and minerals, but they're substances that will help to prevent diseases. They are things that help to keep us healthy. So we know now about most of the vitamins and minerals in our food supply, but we're only learning about phytochemicals. And so we really can't duplicate all of them because we simply don't know about them. So we're going to be talking about the importance of eating whole foods. And one of the basic reasons is because of all the fabulous phytochemicals that do so much to keep us healthy that we have not yet discovered or don't know enough about and you can only get them by eating whole foods. But today we're going to focus for the most part on fats. Now, we've done a study ourselves at the Smith Institute, and we, I know that there have been a number of studies published uh, through the ICA and so forth. And we found that a significant percentage of the IC population is food sensitive. Let me ask you, how many here feel that their bladder symptoms get worse after certain either beverages or foods or whatever. OK, I see quite a show of hands. So I think we could all agree that the majority of patients who have IC are, in fact, food sensitive. Now, there are different trigger foods. We know what some of them are. We don't know what all of them are. But we do know that some foods tend to be most problematic in this population. The study that we did and that others uh, have done have found that the most problematic foods include things like coffee, tea, soda, alcohol, uh, citrus fruits, juices, artificial sweeteners, hot peppers, and tomato products. That is true for many people, but the one thing you have to keep in mind is it's all individual, and there are no two people in this room who will have the same food triggers, the same exact symptoms as a result of eating those foods. This makes it kind of complicated for us, because it would be nice if we said, OK, everybody gets a trigger when they eat tomatoes. Then we could investigate tomatoes, and we would know what the problem is. But it's a lot more complicated than that. Some people can eat tomatoes, 
can't eat chocolate. Some people can have coffee, can't have soda. We simply don't know. So it's led to a lot of questions, and hopefully one day we'll try to figure out exactly what it is in the foods that makes a difference. So fortunately, we have found that in the studies that have been done, the one thing that does not seem to trigger bladder flares are fats. And so we're going to be talking about fats today. We're going to focus on fats. And we are also going to learn that there are some really wonderful things about fats that will help us to decrease chronic inflammation and help us to maintain good health. So we're going to take a primer on fats. Now, I'm not going to get uh, technical. I don't want to throw out words that you're not familiar with, but I know that most of you have heard the words that I'm going to talk about today, and hopefully I'll clarify them so that you have a better understanding of what you read about in the newspapers, see in the magazines, and hear on TV. Some facts that we have are visible. You can all see butter, margarine, vegetable oils. And then we have fats that are invisible. Those are things like the fats in cookies and cakes and donuts, various processed foods, and even the animal fats like meat, fish, poultry, and dairy. There are fats in there. You don't necessarily see them, but they are there. Now, when we talk about our diet and we say that we eat fats, there are different kinds of fats that we consume. Now, I know you've seen these terms, but I'm sure you don't know what they all really indicate. So we're going to briefly take a look at what these are. In our meals, when we eat fats, whether they are visible or invisible, they consist of these four basic things. Triglycerides, and that's the majority of the fats that we have in our foods. Then we have some cholesterol in the foods. Then we have some phospholipids in the foods. You may have heard the term lecithin. People heard of lecithin? OK. And then trans fats, which has been pretty popular these days because we've heard about their very negative effects on our health. So in your foods, these are the kinds of fats that we have. And these different fats have different functions. Now, this looks a little complicated, but it's really not. We're talking about the fats in our food. We're talking about the majority of fats, which I said a few minutes ago were triglycerides. 95% of the fat in our diet it comes from triglycerides. Now, when you hear the word triglyceride, what does tri mean? Three, OK? So there are three kinds of fatty acids in triglycerides. They are polyunsaturated fats. You've all heard of that, right? You've all heard of polyunsaturates. There are saturated fats, and there are monounsaturated fats. These are the three fatty acids that you have in triglycerides, which make up most of the foods that you consume. Now, let's just take a minute to talk about each one of these. Polyunsaturates are what we're going to spend most of the hour talking about. And so I'm not going to spend the time at this second going through it. I'm going to go through this in depth after. But polyunsaturates are substances that we have in our foods. They happen to be essential. Do you remember the era when fats were considered to be terrible and we had to avoid fats and we should never have fats in our diet? Remember that? Well, that was a big mistake because there are fats that we absolutely must have in order to live. You cannot live without fats. Polyunsaturated fats happen to be a category of fatty acids that are essential. What that means is that you must consume them in your diet. You cannot make them. Your body cannot make them. You must eat them. Now, the polyunsaturated fats have a lot of important functions. And as I said, we're going to keep talking about this throughout the hour, but I, I will say a few things right now and then move on to the others. The polyunsaturated fats, does anybody know what they do? No, and yet you hear the term all the time. Isn't that interesting? Here, the media throws out these terms to you, but yet they don't really tell you what they do. Well, polyunsaturated fats, which are essential, they 
actually keep a lot of the systems in your body working. In every cell that you have, you have these different fatty acids. And these different fatty acids have functions. And the polyunsaturated fats have very important functions of things like keeping your blood pressure normal, keeping your, allowing your blood to clot, and we're now looking into the relationship of the inflammatory and anti-inflammatories, and that's what we're going to talk about a lot later. So polyunsaturated fats, which you see on labels, mean that it's a type of fatty acid, comes from vegetable oil predominantly, things like corn oil, sunflower oil, safflower oil, and fish oil. And so these polyunsaturated fats are essential. We're going to take a look now at saturated fats, which I'm not going to spend much time talking about. Saturated fats you find predominantly in animal products. And so you'll see beef, pork, lamb, full fat dairy. If it's skim, it's not going to be full fat. If it's skim, that means the fat has been taken out. Of course, there are exceptions. The exception to the rule is chicken and fish. Chicken and fish are predominantly polyunsaturated. Now, keep in mind that there is no single food that is only saturated or only poly or only mono. All foods have combinations, but usually there's one single fatty acid that predominates. And so that single fatty acid is what they're going to call the food, a saturated fat, a polyunsaturated fat, or a monounsaturated fat. Is that clear to everybody? Make sense? Okay. The monounsaturated fats, oh, I'm sorry, let me step back a second. The saturated fats have gotten a lot of bad press because it seems as though they are the ones that are implicated in heart disease and other diseases more so than any of the others. And so saturated fats tend to be the ones we're supposed to limit. Right now, that's what all of the literature points out to us, that the saturated fats are the fats that we should be careful to limit in our diets because they don't do any good for the body. They give us flavor, they give us variety, but they really don't do much in terms of keeping us healthy. Monounsaturated fats, you may have heard about the importance of olive oil. Olive, canola, peanut oil, nuts, and avocados, these are monounsaturated fats. These are also very healthy and very helpful for us, and we're going to talk about those also later on. Now, it's not important for you to know the structure and all of that other stuff that goes with this. All you have to keep thinking is, in your foods, you have three kinds of fats that make up the triglycerides, the poly, the saturated, and the mono, and we're going to talk about the wonderful effects of the polys and the monos on your health, okay? So with that, let's just move to the next slide. Okay, so the polyunsaturated fats, which I had said, are absolutely essential to life. They're important in growth, development, in brain function. You absolutely must have them. You must eat them every day, and you do eat them every day. Now, there are two different types of polyunsaturated fats. So here's where it starts to get a little complicated. But one of the things that I did was I made up a fact sheet for you. And it has a diagram. So if you go online, you'll see this diagrammatic fact sheet that points out this stepwise breakdown of what the fats are so that it makes it clearer for you. So the two types of polyunsaturated fats now that are essential that you do and must take in every day are the omega-6s and the omega-3s. Has anyone not heard of omega-6s or omega-3s? So you all have. Pretty popular in the news these days. Okay, so one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that the omega-6s are those that are most commonly found in our diets. They're high in vegetable oils, in the spreads, in the processed foods. We have so much omega-6, far more than we ever needed. We have so many processed foods that we consume, 
you don't even realize how much of the omega-6s you get in. The omega-3s are the ones that we predominantly find in the cold water fatty fish. And these are usually limited in our diet. How many people eat fish regularly? Some of you do, and some of you don't. When I say regularly, do you have it twice a week? Okay, good. That's a good place to be. You must be reading a lot, so you're taking your fish. But the average American does not consume a good balance of the omega-6s and the omega-3s. And we're going to learn why that's a problem in a minute. The omega-6s are the ones that we've got far too much of. The omega-3s are the ones that are usually limited. And so keeping this background information, we'll now go to the next step. The threes and the sixes, even though they're both essential, they are very, very different. They're both metabolically and functionally distinct. And their roles are actually oppositional. The omega-6s increase inflammation, while the omega-3s decrease inflammation. Now, I want to step back again and talk to you about inflammation. Usually when you hear the term inflammation, you think about something that's red and irritated and obvious, correct? Any of you ever think about the fact that there could be inflammation going on in your cells, in your body, at all times that you don't even see and don't even think about? Well, we're discovering that this inflammation in the cells is what's precipitating different kinds of diseases such as heart disease and cancer, and I have that on another cell, so I'm sort of jumping ahead of myself. But the point is, in your cells, you have millions of cells, every one of these cells has the triglyceride fatty acids in the cells, you have the sixes and you have the threes, the sixes play one role, the threes play another role, and so when you have too much of the wrong thing, you have a problem. Now, there are a lot of diseases that are out there. Heart disease and cancer are the two leading killers in the United States. And then we have other issues like arthritis, diabetes, um, irritable bowel, fibromyalgia. And I see these are all considered to be a result of chronic inflammation. You wouldn't think of that, would you? Would you think of heart disease as being chronic inflammation? Would you think of uh, cancer being chronic inflammation? Well, we have to wipe our memories clear of what inflammation really is. Don't think of it as only being that red, raw, inflammatory picture that you see. Think of it as things going on in your cells that are happening that are changing your health and creating problems, okay? And what we're going to try to remember is that the omega-6s are inflammatory and the omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. And if we have a lot of sixes, what are we doing? Creating inflammation. So our unhealthy diets, which we tend to consume in the United States, are often responsible for our immune systems going awry. We are creating a lot of these problems by not eating properly. So researchers have found that the consumption of the omega-3 fatty acids will produce substances that can decrease the inflammatory process. Now, how did we get to think about that? How did we get to know? Anybody know the history? What groups did they look at to find that this situation is something that researchers should pay attention to? Anybody know? The Japanese, yes, absolutely. The Japanese fishermen and also the Eskimos. These two particular groups of people consume very large amounts of fish, cold water fatty fish. And they have a very low incidence of these various chronic diseases, particularly heart disease and cancer. And so the scientists decided, well, let's take a look at their diets 
and C, these are epidemiologic studies where they look at a group of people, they look to see how they live, what they eat, and so forth, and try to figure out, well, why don't they have heart disease? What is it that they are consuming? And so that's what they decided to do. They, would, they looked at um, the diets and they found that the omega-3s were of interest and as a result, they have been studied for the past few decades. So currently, just to repeat, our diets are too high in omega-6s and they absolutely need more omega-3s. Now, what are the best sources of omega-3s? The cold water fish, which is very oily to keep the fish warm, these are the best sources of the omega-3s. This is your salmon, your tuna, your uh, sardines, mackerel, lake trout, halibut. These are all excellent sources of omega-3s. Now, not to go into different kinds of omega-3s, because I'm throwing so many letters and numbers and um, words at you that are a little bit discombobulating. You may have heard the term EPA and DHA. Those are kinds of omega-3 fatty acids. So, when you talk about omega-3 fatty acids and you look at a label, you'll see EPA and DHA. Those are the particular portions of the omega-3 fatty acids that are so healthful, okay? Now, there are other kinds of omega-3s that come from walnuts, flaxseed, canola, and soybean oil. And they're okay, but they are not as efficient as the omega-3s from fish you would have to take a lot more of them and they just will not convert the same way. So you're really best off with the salmon, the tuna, the sardines, the mackerel, the lake, tra lake trout, and the halibut. Now, what if you don't like fish? A lot of people don't like fish. What about supplements? Supplements are a major industry in the United States these days. Well, always keep in mind that foods are best. Foods give you this synergistic relationship of nutrients that God made for us to be eating together. One of the problems that you'll find with a lot of the studies done is that they take isolated nutrients and they study individual isolated nutrients, certain vitamins, certain minerals, or whatever. That's not how we eat and live. We don't eat vitamin E alone, or we don't eat vitamin C alone. We eat these foods as part of number of different products that all work synergistically for our good health. Supplements, unfortunately, are not regulated. You cannot be sure that what you're getting is pure, is consistent, and is really what you need. Supplements do not have the appropriate regulations. They're not regulated. And so you could be buying something in one store that's very different from another store. So you're really best off with foods. But if supplements are the next alternative, then what you want to do is buy from large, well-known companies. I've read so many articles about supplements, and I can tell you that the major store brands like CVS, Pathmark, Walgreens, uh, and Costco, any of those, these are more likely, these companies are more likely to adhere to higher standards because number one, they have a reputation to maintain. Number two, they have money to pay for the testing and you're really better off rather than buying those very expensive uh, designer type of uh, substances that you can't be sure what you're getting. And it's always a good idea to look for the pharmacopoeia seal, the USP seal. Uh, if it's on there, that's a good sign, saying that they have followed certain regulations and standards. So then the question is, well, how much should we take? There are no references for omega-3 fatty acids. We have no dietary guidelines. But from all the literature that, that's out there, and I can tell you that there's quite a bit, one gram a day seems to be the amount that's recommended to prevent uh, myocardial infarction. And then two to four grams a day are helpful for lowering your blood triglycerides, fats in the blood. But you must be careful. If you're taking a large dose, you really need to be under a physician's care because 
like anything else in nutrition, if a little is important does not mean a lot is better. If a little is important, a lot can kill you. In this case, a lot can cause you to bleed. And there are some people who have problems with bleeding, and you would not want to bleed as a result of excess omega-3 fatty acids. So please remember that with anything that we talk about in nutrition. A little bit is important, and a lot, a lot is not good. OK, so the next thing I want to talk about is another very health protective fat, and that's olive oil. You've all heard of the Mediterranean diet. And the Mediterranean diet is something that has been around for thousands of years. And so unlike fad diets and all these new things that come out where they say buy this pill and that pill or whatever, you know that olive oil has been consumed for thousands of years by populations who have very low incidences of cardiovascular disease. And again, the epidemiologic studies pointed out to us that there's a really good product that's going to help to lower our cholesterol, to contain powerful antioxidants. And I think I need a couple hours to really go through all of this with you, so I apologize for not getting into explanations of everything. Um, and then it also contains powerful anti-inflammatories. So you have a lot of really important functions from consuming olive oil. And it turns out that when people have olive oil in place of regular fats, they have lower rates of heart disease, diabetes, colon cancer, and asthma, among other things. Now, that's pretty good. So I would say it's a good idea to consider consuming olive oil. So how much olive oil should you have? Well, some studies show that only two tablespoons a day will lower your cholesterol. So most experts agree that two to three should be the max. Now, remember, the negative is calories. Any oil that you take or fat is going to have calories. And so we don't want to take too much of a good thing and increase our calories to the point where we're going to gain weight, and then that's going to create problems. So you want to be sure that you limit your olive oil to the amount that is good for your health and not going to put weight on you. Keep in mind that olive oil is about 120 calories a tablespoon, and so one serving is one tablespoon. So you're going to want about two or three a day of the olive oil, OK? So the IC-friendly fats that help to keep us healthy, for the omega-3s, we want to enjoy fish, particularly the cold water oily fish. You want the salmon, the tuna, the mackerel, the sardines, the halibut. And it's ideal to have two four-ounce portions a week. That's after cooking two four-ounce portions a week. For the monounsaturated fats, which is the olive oil, you want to have about two tablespoons a day. So if you have the polys that are good, the omega-3s, and the monos that are good, you will be taking things that will enhance the flavor of your food, improve your quality of life, and perhaps make you feel good. Now, we know that IC is, is an inflammatory process, but we don't know exactly how it works. Can we be sure that these things are going to help us? We can't be positive, and we don't know, and we're looking into that. We're trying to find out if there is a definite mechanism. You'll find with a lot of the other diseases, there are mechanisms where you see how those omega-3s work, and a lot of the urine markers that we see in IC also are affected by these omega-3s. So it's a good place to start. And it certainly is good for you in terms of protecting yourself against other kinds of diseases in addition to IC. So remember that whole foods are always better than supplements. And if you go to a nutritionist for anything, that person should be telling you that you want variety and moderation. Never cut out any groups of foods. Make sure that you have a variety, that you have moderation. Because remember, things change in the literature. And we may find out something down the road 
that will keep us from taking the product that we thought today was so great. But remember, years and years, thousands of years of experience with the diets containing the fish oil and the olive oil, I think, are strong enough. It's not a fad. It's not something that we're thinking is just the thought of the day. So we want to vary our diets as much as possible. Practice mindful eating. Think about what you eat. Think about what you eat and make sure you plan on what you're going to eat. People who don't plan end up eating all kinds of junk and anything else that is around. People who do the best at eating healthfully are those people who plan. Take food from home. Carry snacks in your bag. Make sure that you know ahead what's available to you because otherwise you are strapped with whatever is out there which may not be very helpful. And use the elimination diet. How much time do I have still? Am I 10 more minutes? OK. Let's talk for a minute about the elimination diet. How many of you don't know what it is? Some of you don't know. OK. If you want to decide on something that may trigger a reaction, you want to make sure that you eliminate from your diet all known possible triggers and eat as bland a diet as possible and then put back very slowly, not even in the same day, every couple of days, you take a small amount of a food that's a potential problem and you look to see what effect that has. We know that there are a number of foods, a good variety of healthy foods, that are available to IC patients that will not cause bladder flares for the average person. And so what we need to do is go online, go to IC Help, and look at the lists of foods that are considered to be bladder friendly. Consume those foods for a couple of weeks a couple of weeks, because sometimes when you insult your bladder, it takes that long for the pain to go away. So you go on a very bland diet, free from trigger foods, for a couple of weeks. Then, gradually, you take very small portions of new foods and reintroduce them one at a time, usually every couple of days. First, take a small amount. Then take a larger amount and see what happens to your bladder. Will your bladder start to hurt or not? Generally, you can, when you keep a, a log, you can determine your own individual bladder triggers. And that's what you have to do. You all have to be your own researchers. You all have to be your own detectives. You have to be totally in charge of what goes on in your life in terms of foods, medications, environment. You have to think about everything. When you have IC, you don't know what can affect your bladder. It could be foods. It could be medications that you take. There are some medications that may have something in them that will affect your bladder. And you may not realize it. With foods, typically, you find reactions in a couple of hours. Now, it is true when it comes to some things like alcohol you may get an instantaneous reaction. Does anybody have that where you drink alcohol and like in minutes you can feel your bladder? Yes? We have no idea why that happens because there's no way that that alcohol can be absorbed in through your GI system and down to your bladder in such a short period of time. And so some people will say, well, then it's got to be all in your mind. You know it's not in your mind. It's in your bladder. You can feel that bladder pain coming on. You know what I'm talking about. You all know exactly what that is. It's not in your head. It is really in your bladder, right? <laughs> so it may come on in a few minutes. We don't quite understand why or how that works. But we do know that for the most part, foods take a couple hours, maybe two, three hours, before the symptoms manifest. It could take a little longer, but probably not. Medications, on the other hand, might take a little longer. If you start a new medication, you may not start to feel the symptoms for 
the first day or second day, but maybe by the end of the week, you start feeling this dull of your bladder. There it goes. It's starting. Here it comes. It's starting. And you have that ache that starts to get progressively worse, and you can feel it. You feel the throbbing and the pain and the radiation down your legs, and you just want to sit in the bathtub. Well, you should keep your own little diaries. L the nutrition literature points out, in many instances, people who keep food diaries are far more conscious of what they eat, they're healthier, they keep their weight better, and they can determine the problems. And with IC, you'll be able to look back and see, well, this is what I had, and now I've got symptoms, and make the connection. And that's what you want to do. Please try to enjoy your meals. Please try not to skip food groups. Remember, you really don't need to be afraid to eat. If you follow the elimination diet and you eat foods that are generally harmless to the bladder, then gradually add things back. You will be able to find things that are problematic for you. And it will be your own individual list. And your list is the thing that's most important. Don't worry about what another IC patient says or feels, you're the one who is in charge of your body. You know how your bladder feels. You know what's irritating to you and what's not irritating to you. So you have to keep track of it. So with that said, I hope now you all understand about the variety of foods that are healthful in terms of the fats. I hope you understand why they're helpful. And I do hope you'll enjoy them. And I hope it makes a difference in your life. Thank you. We have a few questions from the audience. What is the research on the dangers of too much fish in, or sorry, what is the research on the dangers of too much fish due to pollution and mercury in the water? OK, that's a pretty important question that's been around for a while. And what they basically suggest is that the benefits outweigh the problems with the contaminants. It turns out that the majority of literature points out that the only groups of people who need to be really cautious about overconsumption of fish are pregnant women, people who are immunocompromised, and very young children. But if that's not your situation, Taking two fish meals a week is considered to be safe. So that's the suggestion. And of course, there are some fish that are more problematic than others, like swordfish. Um, they, if you go on the internet, you can look for the list of the high mercury foods, so you would be able to find those. And those you wouldn't, grouper, mahi-mahi, things like that, you would not eat those particular fish. Great. So if you you have IC and you're on a budget, you don't necessarily have to get organic fish if that's not within your budget? If you're on a budget, you can try to get the large packages of salmon on sale. You, you know, the, the cans, that would be really helpful. There are a lot of canned products, by the way, that are very healthful. Don't, that's an old myth that canned foods are terrible. Yes, they have more sodium in them, but they have lots of vitamins and minerals. And in fact, sometimes canned and frozen foods are more nutritious than fresh, depending on how the fresh travel, transported, the environmental conditions, the cooking, and everything else. So canned items are good. Rinse them. Make sure you rinse them. And then you know, they'll be a lot cheaper than anything else. And this way, you can have them available, and they'll be lower in cost. Great answer. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from the audience. I'm allergic to seafood and nuts. What other options should I take to get my omega-3? OK, you, along with the rest of uh, many people in the world, unfortunately, manufacturers are doing a lot of work on the various forms of uh, krill and algae in the waterways. And so now there are going to be omega-3 uh, fatty acids available that come from krill and from algae, which is not the same protein as your fish. And it's good for vegetarians because it also is not considered fish for people who are vegetarian. So you'll have to contact or read the labels carefully. You'll have to look 
They always have these comments, uh, phone numbers that you can contact on uh, bottles of supplements where you could call the manufacturer and make sure that you know what the basic source is. But you can get sources that are not fish protein that are omega-3 fatty acids. So it's safe to say that there's an omega-3 for everyone. Yeah, actually, they're even children, they're flavored. If you eat uncooked salmon, does it have the same benefit as cooked salmon? I'm not a big fan of eating uncooked salmon. Please, nobody throw tomatoes if you love sushi. Um, it's, I've taught too many food service management classes to be able to say, to stand here and comfortably tell you that any raw animal product is okay. Um, you always run the risk of microorganisms, and it's true that with sushi, you have um, parasites that can be killed if the fish is frozen. And of course, you always want to go to a, a store that sells um, sushi grade fish. But I'm sorry, lost track. What's the uh, first part of the question again about the, the fish, the raw fish? Is, is it, it um, as beneficial as cooked salmon? Aside from the concern with the foodborne illness, the interesting thing is that not all foods that are uncooked provide nutrients as easily as foods that are cooked. There are many nutrients that are more available than when the food is slightly cooked because it, it changes the cell structure of the food and makes it more available for you. So um, a really good example of that is lycopene in tomatoes, uh, which people are consuming now to decrease the risk of certain kinds of cancer. And tomatoes are actually better when they're cooked, carrots too. So I wouldn't eat raw, I hate to say it, but I am too old and have gone through this too many times with students to say that I uh, am an advocate of raw animal products or fish products. Um, but if you do love sushi and you have to have your sushi, make sure that you go to a reputable store with an A rating and make sure that their fish comes from reputable suppliers. Great, great response. Another question is, how healthy is coconut oil? How what? Healthy is coconut oil. Ah, another good question. Uh, that, that's the question that I always ask my students not to ask me. Um, <laughs> because there's so much controversy about the coconut oil. The interesting thing is that the coconut oil, even though it's from a vegetable product, happens to be highly saturated. Saturated leads to cardiovascular problems. But there are all different kinds of saturated fats. And it turns out that the kind of saturated fat in coconut may be OK. And so I have to tell you, we don't know for sure. There are convincing arguments either way. And there are many populations that have existed on coconut oil for a really long time and don't have the same diseases that we have. So even though coconut oil is notoriously high in saturated fats, which you should limit, coconut may be OK. So ask me in another couple of years after there's more research out there, and I can tell you for sure. So what do you do in the meantime? Moderation and variety. If you like coconut, you have some coconut. But don't go crazy with the coconut. Thank you. We have another question from the audience. If an IC patient eats or drinks something they know is a trigger, but he or she chooses to eat or drink it anyway, Will she or he do damage to the bladder over the long term? Or will it just result in a flare that will eventually resolve? Uh, that's a good question for Dr. Muldwin. <laughs> um, well, I can tell you my experience with, and I, well, let's see what other people think. I know that if I were to have a cup of coffee, my bladder would hurt for two weeks, and then it would get better. Does anybody have a situation where you've eaten something and the pain has never gone away. So I guess, what do you think, Dr. Moldwin? <laughs> I wish we knew the answer for that, but I, I think, and, and you know, I'll tell you another quick story. I had a patient who insisted that she could drink coffee. She told me, oh, my pain's the same no matter what. I really can have the coffee. I said, please, please don't have coffee for three weeks. So after two weeks, she emailed me. She said, I don't know. I still 
you know, have the same feeling. Well, after three weeks, her pain subsided. And then she went on a road trip, and she had a cup of coffee to keep awake, and sure enough, the ICP pain came back. So it could last a really long time, but we don't really know why or how or whatever. How about decaf coffee? Decaf coffee, unfortunately, does not sit well with IC patients because it may not be the caffeine that's the issue. We don't know for sure that it's the caffeine in the coffee that's the problem. There are numerous compounds in coffee, lots of chemicals, lots of acids and aldehydes and things like that that could be problematic to the bladder. And so um, even the decaffeinated products create problems. I'm a firm believer of no coffee, no tea, and no alcohol. That's my bias, but that's what I tell my patients. I live on Cafix, and I don't have any stock in Cafix. The Cafix is a coffee substitute. You have Cafix, Pyro, Aroma, Postum. These are all made from grains. They don't taste exactly like coffee, but they're pretty good. And I make samples for my patients, and I think maybe one patient or two in years has not liked it. Everybody else likes it. So uh, stay away from the decaf coffee. Stay away from any of the uh, coffees and teas, in my estimation, if you were to ask me. Uh, you could speak to another expert who would disagree, but I would suggest keeping away from coffee, tea, and alcohol, and drinking Cafix, Roma, Piro, or Postum. Uh, or Kava. If it doesn't bother you, that's a low acid coffee, if it doesn't bother you. Because we're not sure about the acid. There are studies that have been done that point out that acid was put, Dr. Fenster put acid directly into the bladder of IC patients, and they didn't find that that was problematic. So we don't know if it's the acid. There's a lot of talk about acid, but we're not sure what it is. So Dr. Shorter, we learned today about omega-3 and 6. What about omega-9? Okay, omega-9 is another kind of fatty acid that's found in olive oil. And your body can make the omega-9s. You don't have to worry about it. Um, the omega-3s and 6s you cannot make. And you need both of them. By the way, I should have said before, you need both 6s and 3s. Even though the 6s in excess can cause inflammation, the fact is they also have very important functions. So you need sixes, you need threes, but you need the right balance. The other thing I should mention is that when they talk about cardiovascular disease in omega-3s and omega-6s, they always say the omega-6s cause the inflammation, the omega-3s don't. So then you'd say, well, then I shouldn't have any omega-6s at all. You need some omega-6s because they have their own important functions. Omega-6s, you need a certain amount of blood clotting you don't want not to clot, so you need a certain amount of omega-6 functioning, you need a certain amount of omega-3 functioning, but it's the balance that's important. So I hope I got that across as well. And we have time for one quick question. Is shrimp high in omega-3s? It's not particularly high in omega-3s, but if you like it, enjoy it. Thank you everyone so much for your questions.